The best morning greetings to you, everybody, from the northeast corner of what is soon to be sunny South Africa. The dawn is just ignited there on the eastern horizon. This is Safari Live. I'm led to believe it's about 11 degrees Celsius here. That is what the weather report says. The weather report, of course, a greater work of fiction normally than the Zimbabwean elections of 2008. Now, my name is James Hendry. On camera today is uh, Eggsy the hipster. Uh, Eggsy is sporting a very hipster watch this morning. Every day we think that he's losing his Cape Town hipster nature, but he, he doesn't disappoint with some uh, piece of accessorization. Uh, otherwise known as an accessory, that shows he is still in the mind frame of Cape Town. Good morning, Eggsy. There we are. Uh, on the other vehicle, Jamie Patterson is driving around. Uh, she's being filmed by the diminutive Vian Dordenbrach, and they will, are going to look for Shadow, who they managed to find yesterday evening just before the close of drive. Our plan today is to go up here towards the east and then north to see if we can't pick up on the lions that were shouting possibly until, well, certainly until I fell asleep around about quarter past ten last night, and then again this morning, and Chris Rogue and a few others have noticed or certainly heard them calling on the dam cam during the course of the night. So they're somewhere around. Uh, whether they're on Juma still, I don't know. In case you're wondering what on earth this is, what you've stumbled across, who is this strangely garbed human talking to you on the internet on a live stream, you are on a live safari. That means exactly what it is. Uh, we're about to go on a drive through the middle of the Kruger National Park, a little section on the western fringes called Juma, uh, Cheetah Plains to the east and Arethusa to the west. And hopefully we'll see some of the spectacular creatures that we have here on offer. The only thing left for me to tell you is that you must please talk to us during the course of the next three hours. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv and that will give you, uh, well, access to my ear. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer any questions that you have. If I can't, we'll ask Jamie, and if she can't, well, I doubt anyone can. In the final control today, uh, doing all of the sort of um, complicated mechanical stuff and vision mixing, uh, it's a pleasure to have Geraldine Cheesecake Kent in my ear and Kirsten McLennan-Smith on the keys. Let's go straight across to Jamie and find out how her shadow search is going. Good morning and welcome to another glorious day here in the African bush. My name is Jamie and I have Viam on camera with me with his hands wrapped up nice and snug and warm because although we're coming now to the end of winter there's still a little bit of a nip in the air whenever we set out first thing in the morning. So yesterday afternoon Viam and myself had a marvelous time out exploring basically the boundary of Juma and Arethusa which is our sort of the middle of our traverse area at this point. Uh, for now, we have temporarily put our search for Shadow on hold. I did find your tracks, but we'll come back to that in a moment. We've just got a report that wild dogs have come racing across from Simbombili onto Juma, and now it's up to us to try and figure out exactly where they have gone. So I've come through to Impala Plains area to stop and have a look and just see what the animals are doing. We've got one we had one lone female impala. I don't know where she's gone now. We've also got some kudu who look relatively relaxed, but the female impala did not. She looked terrified. She was breathing fast. She looked a lot like an impala does when they've just run away from wild dogs. They are alert. They're not completely relaxed. They keep looking off in that direction. Okay, we can't, we can't stop for too long. We can't delay for too long. Wild dogs are fast. So I'm uh, sorry, lovely kudu. Those two blacksmith lapwings. Let's just watch them. Look, look at that, preparing for summer. You see, that's quite a bright shot. Oh, 
there we go. That is the blacksmith lapwing. And as we head towards September, like I said, the birdies are going to become increasingly amorous with each other. I've never seen that before, everyone. That's a first time. There are three of them, you know. There's another one flying around above. Perhaps a jealous and scorned lover that must now go and find someone else. And also there, now the little bird there, Eggsy, is a three-banded plover. There we are. You might also vaguely be able to hear in the background the greater blue-eared glossy starling. Oh, we, I can actually see it, but we don't have the zoom lens or the super zoom, so we're not going to try and show it to you with the small lens. And that little plover will be looking for snails and other little invertebrates that live in the water. And unlike the hippos, of course, these aquatic birds can fly off when the water eventually does dry out. But still, they too will feel the pressure, especially as the migrants start to return, hopefully expecting new summer life. Uh, but until the rains come, that's not going to happen. Right, wonderful. Let's move on. Everybody, the, so the entire morning spent looking for wild lions, as Jamie said, has resulted in us finding a dead tortoise. You see that, Zunder? Exi, the universe hath smiled upon us. It has given us a dead tortoise uh, that we didn't spot, actually. Connor managed to spot it. I think he was looking for something to eat at the time. He's so far eaten an apple, a banana, what else? Some biltong, which is uh, beef jerky, for those of you who don't know. I've no doubt he's got a number of other snacks as well. Now, I'm going to get up onto some solid ground here and tell you what we did find. Although it must get a little boring hearing this sort of thing. We found more lion tracks. No lions. Two lionesses this time, going from the road that we were on, sort of this way, into the block. I did walk briefly on into the block on the tracks, um, and then I lost them, which is not surprising. And I think they're heading, well, they're definitely heading towards this road, so we might be lucky. We haven't driven this road yet. Let's just have a quick look at this rather splendid fellow. Is um, well, what was a rather splendid fellow, a, a speaks hinged tortoise, and there is the hinge. You can see he's able to close the back up uh, when he's not in an advanced state of rigor mortis. Uh, but that's just a kind of sort of loose bit of cartilaginous, uh, what would we call it, cartilaginous piece of the carapace, so it can close up a bit. But if you look inside there, you can see the bones. And often people think of the shell of a tortoise as being something sort of like the shell of a snail, which is so totally separate to the actual animal. But that is not the case here. This forms an integral part of actually the, um, the skeleton, and the skeleton attaches to the underside of the tortoise's shell. And that's why often, once they've been eaten like this, you can still see the bones inside. Anyway, I don't know what happened to him. We found the other day five or six of them in this same sort of state, the flesh eaten out from inside them, but no obvious damage to the carapace or the plastron, so the shell is almost totally undamaged. I don't know what's eating them. I really don't. Quite interesting. All right. Exhibit, we're going to return this to the wild. We picked up by the next Wild Earth guide to drive past here and go, oh, there's a dead tortoise over there. Let's have a look. That's, there's a hole there, and obviously 
the squirrels are living in there. I just saw a squirrel run in there. There, there watch, coming up off the top, off the top. Here we go, well spotted. I'm now going into the nest, perhaps. Ah, oh, thank you, Mr. Squirrel, for sitting for us. Very nice. Top sighting of the day so far, Zander. Oh look! Did you see that? It stuck its head out of the stuck its head out of the nest. Just keep watching there. Just blinking in the morning sun. That's really sweet. Trying to stay warm. We had a lovely question yesterday about why it is that elephants do not have any fur on their bodies, and I went into the explanation of the. Um, surface area to body ratio. If you're a squirrel, your surface area to body ra to body mass ratio is much higher. Is that correct? Yes, it is. That means that you've got more surface area per kilogram of mass than you do uh, if you're an elephant, and that means that you lose heat very quickly. And so squirrels will sit in the sun very early morning, fluff their fur out, and. Uh, sort of ball up in the same way that I guess your house cat does if it's cold. Those elephants are not known for balling up in the sun. I didn't know we were live. Thank goodness I didn't say anything bad. Um, how long have we been live? There's a monkeys, everybody. Oh, well, that's good. Oh, I see. Okay, I was telling Connor that this wasn't a good tree for monkeys to be in. I have no idea why I didn't know we were live. I do apologize, everyone. Uh, it's not a good tree for monkeys to be live, to be in because you can see that they can't jump from this tree to another tree. Now, monkeys, if we drive towards them, they will probably be relatively relaxed. But if we were to approach this tree on foot, what you'd find is that they would panic. Um, they'd probably jump out of it, and if you tried to climb the tree, then they really would get a fright. It's quite interesting because a lot of people think that a monkey or a baboon feels completely safe in a tree. They don't. They realize that they're cornered. And they are not sure, as far as human beings go, how good we are at climbing trees. Because we look like we should be able to climb trees, uh, but obviously we're fairly incompetent when compared with something like a monkey. Now, let's see how close we can get. Oh, this is wonderful. I think we're gonna get a really nice sighting of these things here. So it's a particularly good tree for viewing monkeys in because they don't, they're not often able to go anywhere. And they're sitting in here, obviously trying to get, eat the um, jackalberries. No idea how I missed that we were live. Eggsy knew. We're on the same radio system. eating these, like I say, jackalberries. I'm waiting for them to ripen because they're not so nice now. Monkeys don't mind them too much, but we don't think they're particularly delicious. I fed you one, didn't I, Eggsy? I tried to feed you one, yes. <laughs> and they're also, ooh, there is a tiny little one above us. I don't know if you can even get that one. You see it there? It's right above us, everyone. I don't, I don't think that, I don't think that Eggsy is uh, going to be able to get to it. I will try and take a picture with my camera. <laughs> but because I'm, this, no, never mind, Eggsy. Let's, uh, let's, let's find an easier one. There's one there. Oh, there's a nice little one there.
That's a really pretty tree, this. A nice one there that we're looking at. That's just, look at the light on that one. Isn't it pretty? I'm trying to get a photograph of that one. Failing dismally. There we go. No, he moved. Beautiful. Golden light in the jackalberry tree. And I don't know if you can hear in the background, you can hear the hoop hoop going. Yes, James Richard, I agree with you. You say you're excited for the day that you see jackals eating the fruit of a jackalberry tree. Yes, I think it will be an interesting day. I think I've seen it once before. And indeed, it was interesting. <laughs> Stunning tree. Hello, Harry. You're talking about the tree and you say it looks pretty wide. Do I have any idea how old it is? They're pretty slow growing. Um, I would put, I'm going to say it's probably about 100 or so. But if you look at the trunk, and no one can give me an explanation for why the trunk is like this. It is uniquely twisted in a very even manner. Can you see that? Now, the jackalberry tree is not known to have a fluted stem in the same way that a uh, torchwood tree has got a fluted stem. But look how perfectly and symmetrically it's twisted. And I'm fascinated by how that happened. It's growing on what is essentially a... I mean, it's a damn wall. Which, uh, it's... It is on the banks of this river, but a lot of the soil that it's growing in, uh, it was placed here when they had a dam, basically were in the, underneath it there. And so I wonder if that hasn't um, sort of affected the way it's grown. Look, monkey, I want to get a picture of you. Gosh, you've got to be quick with monkeys. I've got to tell you to take a picture. Otherwise, it's a disaster. Justin, you say, imagine human beings still had tails and how different our daily lives would be. Justin, I, 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 <laughs> I imagine they would be slightly different, yes. Um, I'm not really sure in what way. I mean, I suppose our clothes would be different. We'd have to have special sh pants that allowed our tails to, you know, come out of our, uh, our, our, come out and comfortably sit. Uh, we might use them if they were particularly prehensile to, uh, while we read a book, we might be able to uh, tip coffee into our mouths. Tails might be quite useful. Uh, we might use them to open a door while on the phone. Uh, that's so that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> it's just, and I can't say I've spent a huge amount of time imagining what it would be like to have a tail. Have you, Eggsy? Nope. No. You can... Ah, now apparently Jamie and Viam have talked about this often and decided that they would love to have tails. I think that's quite odd to myself, uh, but, you know, we don't live in a camp of normality. Now, I've just seen a fruit that's been dropped by one of these things, but I don't want to freak them out. Let's just, just watch carefully. They will come back. If they do panic completely because I get out of the car, um, they will come back here. Let's just watch their reaction as I move out the car. I don't think they'll come out of the tree because they've got used to us now. But they will definitely react to me. They will watch me quite carefully now. And they might start making the odd crackling alarm call, going... <laughs> yeah, just... Yeah, I don't know if you heard that. Just went... Kick, kick. 
They're starting to ripen now, and that's what they look like when they're ripe. They don't, they're not very fleshy, but it is quite sweet. There you are, Connor. Must I eat it? Yes, you must eat it. It's a pip. It's a pip. Is it a delicious pip? It's quite sweet. Better. You've had better pips. No, they're obviously not very ripe then. All right, I think let's move on from here. See if we can't get something. It's very frustrating from trying to take pictures of these monkeys. I didn't get one. Okay. Oh, Viola, a nice question from you again. Please do tell us where you're from. It's always so nice to know. Um, you want to know, are these friendly monkeys? Well, I, mean, I don't think they're unfriendly, but Viola, I think probably quite a lot in line with what Jamie was talking about, about domesticating animals and keeping wild animals and that sort of thing. It's, it's a similar sort of uh, end, or it's a similar, it's on the spectrum of the same discussion. None of these animals are friendly around people if they come into contact with people. So monkeys are afraid of us around camps, where they get into camps, where uh, they steal food and where people feed them, they become extremely unfriendly and they will bite people, especially women. They're completely chauvinist. They leave men alone generally, but they bite women. I don't know why, um, but that is the case. And it's because people think and hope they're going to be friendly that they are fed. So if you go to a camp, any camp anywhere in South Africa, they will say, do not feed the monkeys, please. About 70% of tourists are unable to take this uh, instruction seriously, and they think the monkeys are so cute, and they take an orange and they give it to the monkey, and the monkey takes it and looks like this, and then it bites them. And so they remain friendly as long as they're not used to us. No wild animal out here is, um, inherently particularly friendly to human beings and it's only it's once they lose their fear of us that it becomes quite nervy much grunting Wonderful sound that Impala make that are is so incongruous. Okay, so this morning is this morning of the is the morning of Impala sightings. Let's see if they carry on, although generally this sort of behaviour at this time of year doesn't last all that long. It's quite fun to see when they do do it, chasing each other around, looking big and scary with their tails up and the males behaving in a very silly manner. Are you done now? He's not. He's not. <laughs> He's going to... Oh, oh, no. We've all calmed down again. Now, during the rutting period, the males are incredibly distracted, which is a boon for the predators of the area. Which is why during the rutting period we noticed that both Karula and Shadow were very successful in terms of catching male impala. And Kimberly was wondering about, for the poor impala, how much they need to sleep. Since as you can imagine, when you're on everybody's menu, nap time is done with a little bit of um, reticence. Now the answer is they don't need to sleep very much at all. They might doze for a couple of minutes at a time usually separate that's why having a herd is such a big advantage because you can close your eyes and know that there's lots of eyes and ears still looking out for you so they don't go to sleep at night they'll go and they'll lie down and they might doze off every few minutes but that's where ruminating comes in because the process of ruminating you know when they either lie down or just standing bringing up the boluses of grass from in their second or in their first stomach in the rumen they bring up the, the ball of cud and they start to chew it and then they 
swallow it and they start it's one of the ways that their digestive system is very very effective and what studies have shown is that the brain waves of ruminating animals mimic those of us in deep sleep so whilst they do not need to sleep for long periods of time they kind of get that brain rest that the body needs in order to repair and to jump start all of its processes are you done now boys a whole herd of bachelors a gentleman's club of impala right and now we're all done we're all relaxed again back to breakfast a little bit of sparring a little bit of exercise I'm kind of hoping if we sat here, the wild dog might come sprinting through. I'm actually going to put my radio on to scan. <laughs> Blobbit McBlob has said that he would not like to be an impala because I'm far too fond of sleep. Fair enough. I agree with you. Sleep is a wonderful thing. I wonder, I know that I, I often think that cats enjoy their rest time. And of course, lions and leopards are champion sleepers when they want to be. But I wonder if they get the same enjoying, enjoyment out of nap time in the same way human beings do. Or are human beings the only creatures that nap just sort of for fun and enjoy it? And because they want to, you know, live in a place where they can have a family, I know many who've had families in the bush and managed to survive very well with them. So it just it depends on your sort of unique situation, I guess. I hope that kind of answers your question. All right, I can smell Amanda's uh, bacon on the skillet as we speak. Sm smells very delicious. But before I'm able to put that into my beak, I must say two things. The first thing is a goodbye to all of you, and thank you especially for your conversation today. I, I've, the three hours has flown past, and that's because uh, not because I've managed to find anything of great worth, but because all of you said uh, gave us some great questions and comments. So thank you to all of you for taking the time to watch. The second thing I need to say before I say goodbye is a very happy birthday to Mrs. Wallington, who is uh, turning, uh, I think it's 22 today. Mrs. Emily Wallington, wife of Graham, the creator. And uh, so happy birthday, Emily. We'll hand you back to Jamie for the last few minutes and see you this afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Ali, I've had, I've had some upset guests that feel as though they've been shortchanged by, not, by us not finding an animal, but at the same time, you've got to explain it properly. And it's very, very seldom that people are not understanding about the fact that you, it's not a zoo. You can't drive up to each and every individual animals and know exactly where they are. So a lovely question from Ali. No, I've never had a really angry guest. So I've sometimes had some, some sad faces, disappointed faces, but not necessarily angry. And so we come to the end of a lovely but somewhat quiet morning. The cat's drawing rings around us. Hopefully we'll follow up on them this afternoon for the Sunset Safari. So a big thank you to Viam for his wonderful camera work as always, as well as to Kirsty and to Jerry in Final Control. Jerry doing a marvelous job of directing. And then most importantly, a big thank you to our viewers, new and regular. It's always a pleasure having you on board and we look forward to seeing you in just a few hours. Bye-bye, everybody.